we're on. Welcome from welcome to welcome from the worldwide. Welcome to you from the worldwide Bible class. Pastor Wolfmuller, St. Paul and Jesus Staff Lutheran Churches in Austin, Texas on this Holy Wednesday, studying the life of Jacob together with Martin Luther. Let's take a look at the text. Now, we'll remember that that Luther was talking last time about um he was talking last time about how you do what you can, do what's in you. That's the idea of the uh, of the scholastics. But he was saying Jacob is not wrong to send his family across in two camps. Remember, Jacob was greatly afraid. J he heard that Esau is coming with 400 men. He's greatly afraid and distressed. So he divides the people that were with him, the flocks and the herds and camels, into two companies. And he says if Esau comes to one company and attacks it, then the other company, which is left, will escape. That's that's his best he can figure. It's like, let me just lose half instead of losing all. Then Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham. Now this is uh this is going to be the prayer that Luther's gonna discuss here the second he turns to prayer. And and let's just get um Jacob's prayer here. Jacob says, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Abraham, Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal with you. In other words, he says, Lord, you're the one who sent me to back here. So I'm doing this because you commanded it. Now it looks like I'm going to be destroyed because of what, but because of what you gave me to do. Return to your family, and I will deal with you. I am not worthy of the least of all of the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. So he confesses his own humility and his his lack of deserving what the Lord has given him. This is a great, there's great faith here. Uh, for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. So I, I started out with a stick, and now look, huge family, flocks, etc., etc. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother and from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be uh, numbered for multitude. So there is Jacob's prayer. Now we're going to get Luther's comment on this prayer. The second thing that he does is turn to prayer. Now remember the first thing that he did was he divided the family in two and sent them over half and half those the the kind of arrangements of reason but now he turns to prayer and thereby he also takes precautions not to tempt god this is the this is the kind of rubric with which luther is is running this through is are we tempting god for here is faith although weak shines forth through almost Though almost overwhelmed by troubles and terrors, inasmuch as he's afraid that he'll be slaughtered with his whole company and flocks. This is the right action. Prayer is the right action, especially necessary in tribulation. I don't know if, I mean, just as a pastor, this is how this happens most often to me when people are really in distress and trouble. And I'll come and I'll say, I don't need to tell you to pray, do I? And and everyone says, no, we have never prayed as much in our whole lives as we have now because of this, because of all this trouble that we have. So, so tribulation is the house of prayer. It's the schoolhouse of prayer. He does not presume that something miraculous and beyond his strength must be done with his sword. He does not tempt by God by despairing and casting off all suggestions of reason, but he begins to rouse himself to invocation. Nevertheless, this is still a struggle. We have often said when faith is weakest, it's strongest. And and Luther's going to lean on this, that it's, it's, it's the Lord who puts Jacob right in the spot. In fact, Jacob is right where the Lord wants him, although it doesn't seem so nice for Jacob, does it? I mean, it's a real mess for him. And yet the Lord has Jacob for just where he wants him. He, he, he wants this tribulation, this temptation, this trouble to come upon him because he's, strength, he's going to use it to strengthen his prayer and his faith. When faith is weakest, it's strongest because w what does it have? Nothing except for God. All, all Jacob can do, look, I've done everything I can do. Now the sun is set. My family's divided in half. 
ready for slaughter. And I've got nothing left but to pray. That is all you need. I mean, that that is the that is the victory. But we it, but it often takes the the Lord has to work to get us there. So wonderful the works of God. This, in other words, God is the one who does this. That makes when faith is weakest, it's strongest. It's this. It's the nature of faith. He quotes Isaiah sixty: "The least one shall become a clan." So the least, here's the smallest, becomes a clan, and the smallest one becomes a mighty nation. That's the weak becoming strong. Paul says, Second Corinthians twelve: "I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses." For when I'm weak, then I am strong. And this is the this is the point of that the Lord is training all of us in this. Jacob here is very weak in his terrors and troubles, amazed, dejected above measure. We, we I mean, you can think of Jacob's prayer with Jesus' prayer in the garden. In fact, I think I think Luther had made that point earlier, or he's about to. I can't remember where where we are, but this is a, this prayer of great distress. There's nothing left. I've got nothing left. Yet his faith was never stronger because faith, which struggles against unbelief, draws, as it were, the last and deepest sighs. So when it looks like faith is about to die, that's when, in fact, it comes alive because it, it has nothing left in itself. It can only trust in God. You see, this is this is quite amazing. Now, now, just to pause for a second here, and to take stock of what we're doing. Here we are, reading Luther's um, Genesis commentary. This is a you know his lectures that he he gave at the seminary on the Book of Genesis. Do you see how there? It is hard to tell the difference between a a Bible study and a sermon with Luther. I mean, he is, he's, he, here we are with Jacob and he's given us the details. He's talked about a few of the Hebrew words, et cetera, et cetera. But he sees Jacob as a Christian struggling to believe in the midst of all sorts of trouble and, and that the Holy Spirit has preserved this for us so that we would do the same. It's amazing. And so you get down to these deep sighs of prayer that no one understands, neither Jacob or anyone else. It's the ineffable groaning, which Romans 8 talks about. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. That's when faith is down at the, oh, there, ooh, I don't know what to, that's when it's the strongest. It's not the voice of triumph, but in reality, it's a groaning by which the afflicted heart only sighs and seems to draw breath with difficulty. Isaiah calls it a smoking flax. Remember when Isaiah says that you will not quench that floating that smoking flax and the like the like the um like you know when you light a match and then you blow it out and it has that little smoke. He says the Messiah won't even snuff out that little smoke smoking flax and a reed which is not whole but crushed and shattered but although there's nothing weaker and more feeble than this groaning for as it were the last breath it's nevertheless ineffable it has strength it's unconquerable it has strength not because of its own kind of power strength of conviction it has strength because it because we are empty and all that's left is god these are contrary, contradictory modifiers, yet they're true. The weak become strong. Nor is there anyone who can grasp or explain in words how much this groaning is able to do. For my power, the Lord says, my power is made perfect in weakness. I have that. I have that right on the, I have a, you guys can't see it, but um, there's a window right there and two windows in a little row between them. And I have note cards that I have Bible passages on. 
And that started when I got COVID a couple of years ago. And I had one card there. And it, this is it's exactly this text from 2 Corinthians. My strength is made perfect in weakness. That was the thing that just, I think I've told you guys that story. It's It, it was just stuck in my own mind. When I was as low as I suppose I've been, that the, the here the Lord says, my strength, my power is made perfect in weakness. Made perfect. That word perfect is the telos, the te, from tetelestai, made complete. It's great. The flesh, to be sure, cries out that it does not understand this. In fact, it feels and experiences the contrary. The flesh says, my weakness is made perfect in weakness. <laughs> this, however, is sure. Weak power is perfect. And on the other hand, perfection is weakness. Whoever spoke in this way, beware of I cannot. When the devil has brought you to the point that you cannot do anything, he has already lost. <laughs> this is so great. The devil brings you to the point where, look, I can't see a way out. I can't fix the problem. I'm stuck myself. And says that that that's where that's exactly where the Lord wants you. Don't add your agreement by despair. In other words, don't agree with the devil's confession. I cannot, because it's ineffable. It's an ineffable groaning. So Scripture speaks. For when despair is not added, but they're sighing, then there is the most perfect power in the weakest weakness. Wow, it's just, it's unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, this is this, how the Lord deals with us according to his kindness so that he doesn't look for strength. Um, where did I go? Oh, yeah, here. I'm sorry, I scrolled the wrong way. So that the Lord doesn't look it upon us in our weakness, but he looks upon us with grace and mercy and deals with us according to our weaknesses so that even when there's nothing left, just sighing, that's when we have the victory. I mean, look, this word, you know, this, if this is all riddles, Luther kind of unfolding the scriptural riddle. Power is perfect. Perfection is weakness. When the devil has brought you to the point you can't do anything, he has already lost, not won. That's what you expect. The most perfect power and the weakest weakness. That's just, what a phenomenal paragraph. Uh, the Lord said to Moses in Exodus 14, 15, why do you cry to me? Moses was not crying, but he had become dumb with fear. No sound of any voice was heard. He was like a dead man, but the Holy Spirit who understands that groaning utters what a prodigious cry. And how does he cry? Abba, Father, oh, my dear God. Here despair is not yet complete. But there is left a spark of faith, a little sigh, a little groan, which is very small in your eyes, but very large in God's ears. Here's another one for someone grab these for writing poems or making art. There's this little groan. It's small in your eyes, but very large in God's ears. Uh, in fact, this little groan, this little ineffable sigh is a shout that rises above all shouts and fills heaven and earth so that God cannot bear not hearing it and replying, why do you cry to me? Jacob therefore prays with ineffable groaning as follows. And now we're going to get into the prayer. Now, I want to check that I, I did not do this. So I need to go, we need to go over to Exodus 14, 15, because what Luther's saying here is that there's, um, ah, uh, Moses doesn't say anything, and and the Lord hears it as a cry. So here, here it is. They're they're um they're they're at, by the Red Sea. Uh, and he says, uh, he said the Lord will fight for you. You have to only to be silent. And then the Lord says to Moses, "Why do you cry to me?" In other words, there is no cry there in the text. That's interesting. And yet the Lord heard Moses crying. So the most effect that the, the most effective prayer, the prayer that fills heaven, is the oh. Someone told me, who told me this? Oh yeah. Pastor Davis told me that he was watching a some sort of one of these TV shows or something where it talks about how sighing is good for you. It's healthy to sigh. 
<sighs> so now he's been, I think he said that in defense of, you know, I'll say something at in the office and he'll go, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but I have no shortage of ideas. So in the office, that's how it is. It's like, all right, I got an idea. And it's, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's that sighing's good for you. That's we're all getting very, very healthy. Okay, here it is. Jacob's sigh. Wait. Yeah, let's we can say it that way. Jacob's prayer. Verse nine. And here we're looking, you know, over on the left, we've got New King James, we have the ESV hanging out over there. This is Luther's own translation. So this is Luther's translation from the Hebrew into German. And then the translator of this text brought it from German into English for us. So this is kind of an English translation of Luther's translation. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who didst say to me, return to your country and to your kindred and I will do you good. I am not worthy of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. Lest he come and slay us all, the mothers with the children. But thou didst say, I will do you good and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Notice how how Jacob, he said, he's, look, I'm afraid. He's not, he doesn't hold back, but he brings God's words back to him. Look at how much he quotes the, the Lord himself in this text. You're the one who said, go into this land. You're the one who gave the promise. And and this is really what prayer is. Uh, uh, Tim Pauls, my friend, pastor up in Idaho, he says that prayer is like the children who always are saying, but dad, you promised, but dad, you promised. And this is how we're praying. But dad, you promised. Look, this is how Jacob is. Oh Lord, you're the one that said this. The languid and despairing faith of Jacob nevertheless does not completely despair. The flax smokes, but it is not extinguished. The reed is crushed, but it is not, not cast off. According to Paul's statement, we're afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, etc. In other words, we're very close to the end of the rope, but we are still holding on. Therefore, he begins to breathe a little, but with must, much hesitation. It is moreover an outstanding example of an excellent prayer, which has all the conditions that are required for a good prayer. Luther's going to comment on this and especially as he's training these pastors because one of the things a pastor has to do is not a pray i mean every christian is learning how to pray pastor has to go and pray in front of people offer the public prayer oh that one could do it in the new testament the doctrine and promises concerning prayer are set forth in great abundance but who can carry it out uh here we're going to see luther actually unfold <clears throat> this is interesting let me let me do a little a little blackboard here first. Remember when Luther is introducing prayer to us in the large catechism. And he says that there's <clears throat> sorry, there's four things that we need to do by introduction to prayer. And I think this is a really beautiful outline. He says, number one, we remember that prayer is commanded. So we have the command to pray in the in the second commandment, um, remember the Lord's name by keeping it holy. We have the, the command to pray in um, all throughout the scriptures, uh, knock, ask, seek, etc. We have this command, the Lord commands our prayer. The second is the Lord gives promises for prayer. And here um, we go especially to Psalm 50. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will hear you and uh, and I will answer you. Also, Jesus, who says, whoever knocks, the door will be opened. Whoever uh, seeks will find. So we have the promises that God will hear and answer our prayer. We also have the great need for prayer. And this is not just the need for prayer, but the need for the Lord's help. So th this, is, th this is maybe the most important part of the discussion 
when it comes to prayer in the large catechism because because it's at the Luther's going to say when the Lord tells us what to pray for he's first telling us he's opening our eyes to what we don't have and and this and this means that scripture is that when we when we learn how to pray from the bible the scripture is the prayer is first god's word to us and then it's our word to god uh so that so that's a unique thing about the lord's prayer especially that it shows us this great need and it expands our need we we have these we have the little kind of sense that we need something like we get hungry and thirsty that tells us we need food and drink we get cold i guess that tells us we need shelter we feel bad that tells us we need something to help the conscience what what, what it is is forgiveness saving this need for prayer is really important in fact uh melanchthon when he wants to argue grace alone um at some point in the apology of the augsburg confession he says, look at how often in the Old Testament the Lord's people pray. And that when they pray, they show that they do not have the thing that they're asking for, that they need help. So that prayer itself is a proof of, of, our, of sin and of God's grace, and that it is His grace alone that we depend on. It's just, there's a lot here. And then the fourth is that in the Lord's Prayer especially, the Lord gives us the words to pray, our Father who art in heaven, so we we can know that we don't have to wonder, hey, should I be asking these things? Should I be asking for God's name to be hallowed? Yep, answer, yes, because he He told us to ask for that. So we have we have confidence that comes from the prayers, uh, the, the command to pray, from the, prayer, the gift of prayer, the words, uh, from the promises, and then we know that the Lord knows our needs. He even knows our needs better than us, so he tells us what to ask for. Now that is, again, Luther's introduction to the Lord's Prayer in the Large Catechism. Well, let's see if we can see parallels to it here. Uh, who can carry it out? Not even Jacob could, but he's so disturbed that he first arranges everything before he comes to prayer, although it should have come first. So the first thing he should have done is prayed, but first he sends his family over. He can't, he's kind of beside himself, but oh well. But at least he gets to prayer eventually. It should have come first. Psalm 51, 1, have mercy on me, O God, etc. But the flesh taking us captive to the law of sin brings it about that we turn the order around. It's therefore a fault that he turns to prayer more slowly than he should have, but it is the weakness of the flesh that first carried him away to the suggestion of reason. In this manner he began his prayer, O God of my father Abraham, etc., in Hebrew, it's God's. Remember, the word for God is Elohim, which is always plural. There's a few times when it's not, when it's just El, like, but it's almost always then in a compound name, like El Shaddai or something like that. Um, so Luther's just reminding the guys that it's he don't don't forget to do your Hebrew. Uh, it's a glowing prayer in keeping with the spark of struggling faith. It's the cry of Moses at the Red Sea. But first, Jacob's faith appropriates the God of Abraham and Isaac, and later he also calls him his own Lord. Thus, he reminds God of the promises he made to Abraham and to Isaac and to himself. So again, prayer is bringing these promises of God back to God. These greatly increase and kindle his prayer and arouse and warm his struggling faith and smoking flax. You said to Abraham, now, this, this idea of kindling prayer is a really arouse and warming the heart to prayer is a idea that's all over Luther and something, another one of these things that I think we've totally lost. We here, now I'm looking at you guys, we hear this idea that we have to we have to increase and kindle our prayers, arouse and warm our hearts to to prayer. We say, "Oh boy, schwärmerei." That's enthusiasm. That's mysticism. But it's it's all over Luther, and it's probably all over the scriptures. Is that there's this 
sort of we start the prayer out cold, and this is how it seems like Luther reads it, that Jacob says he's he's fearful, he's done everything he can, he's exhausted, he's afraid, and now he says, oh, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you said to me, and here he meditates on the word of God. See this? As he meditates on the word of God, you said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. And then now look at this faith. I'm not worthy of all of these things. So that this meditation on the word of God is causing these his prayer to, to grow. When Luther writes that letter to his barber, Peter, about how to pray, he does the same thing. You're meditating on the scripture, and it's kindling your heart to prayer. We, we're fighting against cold hearts. You guys might be surprised. This is the Lutheran mistake, is that I thought that to be sanctified was to have a cold heart. No. Uh, you, uh, he still struggles. Assuredly, a wonderful thing to have such great strength and such strong pillars of consolations and promises on which to lean and still to be alarmed. But he says, you said to me, return to your country. You led me into this tribulation, this temptation, this dangerous life. It's truly a great consolation when anyone can say, Lord God, it's not by my rashness that I became involved in this calamity, nor by the advice of any wise or foolish man, but you spoke. You ordered it. This is how, I don't know, half the time... Well, maybe not half the time, but a bunch of the times in pastoral care, this is the conversation that I'm having with people. It says, look, the Lord has put you in this situation, so you just got to pray and remind him that if because he put you into it, he's the one that's got to get you out of it. Chris says, I see the chats happening here. God gives us prayer. God giving us prayers is a defense against Babel. We don't tend to know what holy means as a concept, not just to hallow or holify anything, but by the Lord's Prayer, we still ask that God's name be hallowed. That's right. Well, that's nice. Babel, it protects us from Babel in two ways. It protects us from the confusion of Babel. I don't know what I'm talking about. It also protects us from the kind of run-on of Babel. Here's the point. You spoke, you ordered it, therefore I did the right thing in leaving Laban. And now your matter's at stake. Your promise and truth are in difficulty. Your faith must be rescued, not mine. In other words, when we're praying that, uh, that when, we're, when we know that we're acting according to the will of God, we can say, look, it's not, my, it's not my reputation at stake here. It's yours. And this is how Moses prayed, remember, when the, when the Lord was going to destroy the people. The Egyptians are going to laugh at you because you're the one who had this idea of taking us all out of slavery. Now, we might have asked for it, and we kind of needed it and wanted it, etc. But here, the point is, your, it's your plan that's at stake, and the, and the Lord loves to hear that promise. We're not asking for the Lord to help us to manage the difficulties that we've arranged, that we've managed to get ourselves into. No. We're asking the Lord for help in trying to sort out the difficulties that he's got us into. This is that humblest faith and that sighing concerning which mention has uh, been made. It moves heaven and earth. It's the most pleasing prayer. You are the one who said it. Lord, you promised. That's it. Lord, you promised. I'm under your obedience. I must return to my fatherland on your authority, your orders, O Lord. But see what hindrances are placed in my way, namely... My brother with 400 soldiers who are going to kill me, I think. <laughs> I have been driven into these troubles and difficulties from which I cannot struggle clear by my own strength and devices. And this is the point, that the, the Lord will accomplish his works with his strength and not with ours. So he'll bring us to the end of our own capacity and our own strength so that he can do his work. I, I cannot do it by my own strength and devices, therefore... I have need of your help. I can. This is the prayer. I cannot do it by myself, by my own strength. I need your help. Others perhaps did not pray but offered the objection. If we'd remained with Laban, we could have been safe. But Jacob does not trouble himself with those thoughts. It's a very strong prayer. But why does he say further, 
and I will do you good. That's here. Uh, Jacob meant to say, this is, after all, your word. It's your word that you do not want to destroy and harm me, but to do me good in my fatherland, to which you have ordered me to return. So who is the I here? It's not Jacob. This is the Lord. Uh, I will do you, Jacob, good. So here, this is still this is still the 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 word that Jacob received from the Lord. From this it is clear that he was tempted and troubled not only by the devil because of the message of the coming of his brother, but also by his wives, sons, and the whole household with the cry. Now, the, ju just maybe a, a slight exegetical aside here. Notice how um, L Luther is saying, okay, here's what Jacob prays. He's looking very carefully at the at the words of this prayer, and he says, now what's going on in the background? What part of the story did we not hear that makes this prayer make sense? And 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 this is how he's and this is how he's reading it so carefully. It's really quite marvelous. And so he says, uh, he says, well, we know the devil's there. That's true. But it also must have been his wives and his sons and the whole household crying out, "Dear father, wh where are we to turn now? My father, husband, and my master." They cried, "What have you done? Why have you brought us into this critical situation? Just like the people of Israel when Moses brought them to the Red Sea. That's the parallel. So that the people are all complaining." These complaints forced from him the strong words, Lord God, here I beg you, how these people are alarmed and also tormenting my heart, although I know that you have promised to help me in salvation. Thus faith shines forth and makes itself heard, even though it's weak. For he undoubtedly addressed the, them, the family, thus, why are you alarmed? Surely you will not despair. The hope of rescue should certainly not be cast off. I will not lose heart, even if I have despaired. In this manner, he encouraged himself, too, and checked the tears and groans of his people. God did not order me to return, he said, in order to harm me. These things must still turn out well. God will be with us. Only let us use the remedies at hand and cry to him. So the Lord has promised to deal well with him. This is, so, uh, make sure we're we're on this so and i will deal well with you that that luther's seeing behind this phrase that there must have been a lot of complaining going on god has brought you here why not to bless you but to destroy you and also us and he so he's reminding the lord of this prayer that look you promised not to destroy us you promised to bless us such prayers which are poured out in extreme despair and the greatest dangers, are very pleasing to God. These are the ineffable, that word keeps coming up, the ineffable and vehement groanings by which the godly rouse themselves against despair. Do you remember this definition of Melanchthon, of worship? That worship is faith fighting against despair. Now that is a, that is a profound, can we, I wonder if I can find, I, 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 absolutely love that um that little saying uh it's in the treatise power and primacy of the of the pope i wonder if i can i wonder if i can just find it this way let's see oh that's large catechism uh fight the flash that's it uh maybe maybe in this edition it's struggle ah there it is ha ah, about it uh their books mm hmm nope that's not it that's very close uh large catechism no uh. Well, the, okay, 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 okay. This is about as close as we can get to, but this is not what I'm talking about. But the, 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 in in um in the power and primacy of the Pope, uh, Melanchthon has this little line, and he says, "They say nothing about true worship, which is faith fighting despair." And he and he defines worship as that way. Can you have you ever heard? If you ask someone, "Hey, what does worship mean?" And they say worship is faith fighting against despair. I mean, that's a 
it's such a profound definition of it. Now, it's it's other things too, and there's other places where worship is defined, but that idea of I I, I can't see it. I can't see the Lord keeping his promises, but I'm clinging to that word of promise. I'm acting according to that word of promise. I'm praying according to that word of promise, and that that is true worship. Oh. Uh, it does not have to be that way in spite of everything. He means to say, we shall not perish. I shall not die, but live. Psalm 118. I have the promise. That's the key thing. I have the promise. The Lord has said that he wants to do me good. Do not weep, wail, become alarmed. God has ordered us to go out of Mesopotamia and return to my fatherland. I don't have the promise. I don't have I, I have the promise. I don't have anything else. But I have the promise. And that's how God wants to be had by us. I'm going to do the guys over at Issues got me on the hook this year. Go up to the Issues Etc. conference. It's in um it's at Chicago University of Chicago. Uh, or uh, Concordia, Chicago, in oh, I can tell you the day. It's it must be July thirteenth, and they asked if I would present on trusting the promises of God. This is this battle of faith. This is the struggle of the godly, in which they awaken faith powerfully by the remembrance of the promise and the divine command, and by trust in it. I must and will perish. Sorry. I must and will preach. But the devil offers resistance. Very well. Preaching there must be, even if the world should be torn apart. In other words, Luther's now applying this to himself. And what is his office? His office is preaching. And the devil's going to fight against the, the word of God and fighting and fight against preaching. But it's the Lord's business. He's the one who's established the preaching office. He's the one who's put people into it. Very well, preaching there must be, even if the world should be torn apart. Which is what people were saying, by the way, in the time of the Reformation. Luther, you're tearing the world apart with your preaching. Stop saying all this stuff about grace alone and faith alone and law and gospel, etc. There's men of violence who take the kingdom of heaven by force. Carnal men read such things sleepily and understand nothing because they're unskilled and inexperienced in such temptations. They don't know what emotions the man who has who is struggling in extreme necessity here the devil urges all is lost why do you cry out he suggestively asks the afflicted man it's over with you time to give up but the spirit says in opposition all is not lost quite to the contrary it's by no means over i know that god has determined uh, and promised something else in regard to me this is the great fervency and power of the spirit and weakness it's very pleasing sacrifice to God, according to Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifice of mortification, the sacrifice of God is a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Thou certainly will not despise it, for it's a most acceptable sacrifice for a sweet-smelling odor which fills heaven and earth. It's stated in Song, in Song of Solomon 3, 6. What is that coming up from the wilderness, like a column of smoke? It's certainly a slender column. But its smoke reaches up into heaven, and it fills our Lord's nostrils to such an extent that he says, Stop, I can no longer hear. Do you see that? Like, you, you, can you imagine this? So Leanne says, this prayer, this is exactly prayer. This, this is when you blow out a candle, you know, and it has that thin, that thin smoke that goes up like this. You can imagine that, and then the, the, a puff of wind, and it all goes away. But that thin smoke reaches all the way up into heaven, and the Lord says, Enough already. Stop yelling. <laughs> we just are like, oh, I don't know what else, uh, else to do. Uh, and the Lord, and it by the time it reaches heaven, it reaches into heaven, it's amplified beyond beyond anything we could imagine. Stop, I can can't even hear it any any longer. It is a slight and insignificant groaning, but with its odor and crying, it reaches up into heaven into God's presence. This is the the there's a smell to our prayers and it's it's that it's suffering that that is the aroma that carries this prayer into the nostrils of God this is the idea of of incense let my prayers rise before you as incense 
So there's some, there's got to be something that's burning. It's cry reaches into heaven at God's presence, and by it God is moved to give help. Therefore, we should learn to be strong and unbroken in courage. Whatever evils and dangers confront us, and however much despair catches the attention of our heart, we should give heed to what has been said by the heathen poet. Don't yield to evils, but proceed more boldly against them. Who's that? Virgil or something? Yeah. For he who does not yield and slacken his hands. I only guessed Virgil, not because I knew Virgil, but because that's who Luther seems to always quote. I know, I know Luther a lot more than Virgil, that's for sure. He who does not yield and slacken his hands is safe and an excellent priest who has sacrificed the most outstanding and best sacrifice. Jacob was never a more holy priest than in this place, although he had previously been mortified by many temptations. Boy. That's why Moses is so copious and long in this description. Later he'll relate the, the fight with the angel and greater things will be done than Jacob had ever dared to seek or expect. In this manner, God wants our faith to be exercised and aroused that we may grow from day to day and become stronger. So far, the promises are required for prayer. As is taught in the New Testament, also the command. For prayer should not be made in the manner in which the monks sound forth their empty mumbling and batologia of their prayers, paying no attention to the promises or the command, and not thinking of the urgent necessity. So there it is. So I told you that Luther has his introduction for prayer. He talks about the command and the promise and the need. So here we see the command and the promise and the need. Oops, this one should be. So that this is uh, this is call this is calling back that um, that foundational discussion from the large catechism. Uh, that that is the batologia is not praying. In former times, when I was a monk, I used to pray in this way. To be sure, I used to pray in temptation, but the promises and command I did not know. We were only mumbling words. But true prayer should proceed from a believing heart and one that sets before itself both the necessity of God's command by which uh, by which the heart is fired up to present its petitions in faith. Here the individual words are pondered, not as the monks or nuns are accustomed to mumble their prayers absentmindedly and without understanding, so that it's not just the... Um, command, promise, and need, but also we have the words that the Lord teaches us. And he's taught us those words in the Lord's Prayer. He teaches us those words in the Psalms, and we consider them as we pray. He also teaches us those words here with the prayer of Jacob. True prayer does not worry about the number or the multitude of words, but it multiplies and increases the size, which no words can answer except feebly, as appears in this prayer. For Jacob prayed not only these words which Moses relates, but he sighed the whole night through and the whole day. It was a long prayer as far as groaning is concerned, although the words were very few. Then to gratitude and remembrance uh, of past blessings are required of prayer. Gratitude, let me highlight that. So, um, so Luther's adding two more things to our list here too. Gratitude and remembrance of past blessings are required. If these examples are assembled, they stimulate faith in a wonderful manner, and it is very pleasing to God. Let's see if we can find this. This is a good spot to stop. Let's just see if we can find it here in the large catechism. Dun, 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 dun. The Lord's Prayer. Yeah, here it is. Uh, we have heard what we are to do and believe. The best, most blessed life consists of these things. So what we are to do, that is the... Um, that's pretty nice, actually. This is, what are we to do? Ten Commandments. What are we to believe? Large Catechism. I mean, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Apostles' Creed. So that's the three parts of the Catechism. Do, Commandments, Believe. For, the best, best and most blessed life consists in doing and believing. Now the third part, how are we to pray? So that we're going to... We're going to see how uh, Luther's going to unfold this here as well. We can, we're can we in such a situation that we can't pray perfectly, so he teaches us to pray. Um, 
So here, first thing to know is this. It's our duty to pray because God commanded it. So that's the command to pray. Uh, and he goes on for a long time about that. So we have to fight against the any sort of desire to not pray by the commandment. Uh, so we, we pray uh, because God has commanded it. Uh, this is the first and most important point, that all our prayers must be based on obedience to God, regardless of our person, whether we're sinners or saints, worthy or unworthy. We must learn that God will not have this commandment treated in jest. That's why we pray. In the second place, we should be all the more urged and encouraged to pray because God has promised that our prayer will surely be answered. As he says in Psalm 51, call upon me in the day of trouble. And Luther will talk about this. Furthermore, third... We should be encouraged and drawn to pray because in addition to the commandment and promise, God takes the initiative and puts into our mouths the very words we are to use. So the third reason is the words. That's why this prayer is so good. And then um, uh, and then fourth, it's been prescribed for this reason also that we should reflect on our needs, which also drive and impel us to pray without ceasing. So we have the, the command, the promise, the word and the need for prayer. And Luther's added now the remembrance and the gratitude for things done in the past. Uh, Mark says, I've heard different people recommend repeatedly praying the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. How does that fit into what Luther is saying about idle praying or repeating? Look, to pray it once and to reflect on the words is much better than to pray it over and over and over again. And I wonder about this over and over prayer. It seems I'm suspicious that it's I'm suspicious that it's trying to work us up into a mantra. Pastor Jernander says worship fighting despair is paragraph forty four in the treatise. Let's go to treatise. Forty four, here we are. Hey, it's already highlighted. True worship, here, okay, thus they obscure the glory of Christ. He's talking about, the, this is Melanchthon talking about the Catholic doctrine of doubting forgiveness. And he says, but this is, but that's not what we're, what the result is, one, they obscure the glory of Christ. Two, they deprive consciences of a firm consolation. And three, they abolish true worship, that is, the exercise of faith struggling against despair. Faith fighting despair is true worship. Just phenomenal. Just phenomenal. All right. Um, I think this is a good... Oh, yep. We're, I think this is a good spot to stop. We'll say a prayer and then jump in. If you're watching this video later or listening to the podcast, which you can do now, podcast is available then uh, jump in live. It's a lot of fun live because now what we do is we stop recording and we have question and conversation, ask anything, talk about the text, reflect on this thing, uh, all that we've been thinking about. So uh, join us live sometime Wednesday morning. Otherwise, um, thank you guys for being here. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your kindness and love to us in Christ, that you have taught us how to pray, that you hear our sighs and groaning when faith is weak and then it is perfect and strong. We pray that as we reflect on these truths, you would grant us joy and peace in believing through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. Amen.